The death of General Charles Gordon in Khartoum in 1885 sent shockwaves through Victorian Britain, and the government of William Gladstone came under pressure to avenge him. But how? The obvious answer was to march on the Sudanese capital and have a showdown with the Mahdi. But the hitherto gung-ho general, Sir Garnet Wolsey, was now urging an eight-month delay, hardly the immediate response being urged by the British public. So, a plan B was devised. It would entail a joint British and Indian Army operation against the legendary Sudanese general, Osman Digna, and his formidable Beja tribesmen. These warriors had fought the British twice the previous year, and whilst beaten, they had won the respect of the British soldiers, who nicknamed them Fuzzy Wuzzies on account of their elaborate hairstyles. And now, in 1885, they were to clash again at the Battle of Tofrek. But there is more to this story than yet another forgotten battle from Queen Victoria's British Empire. It also involves an ambitious plan to build a railway across nearly 300 miles of desert, and sees the arrival of the first Australian unit to serve abroad on active service, 30 years before Gallipoli. This is the intriguing, arguably pointless, and largely forgotten story of the second Suakin expedition in Sudan, 1885. Now, I've covered why Gordon was in Khartoum and how the British got tangled up in Sudan in previous stories. There are links below if you want to find out more. Nevertheless, just to put this story into context, here is a very fast summary of how we got to this place. In the 1880s, Sudan was ruled by Egypt, where Britain had a strategic interest due to the Suez Canal. When Sudanese nationalists under the Mahdi rose in revolt, Egypt sought British assistance. Prime Minister William Gladstone, an avowed anti-imperialist, was loathed to commit Britain in a costly war in a country in which they had no strategic interest. Instead, he pressurised Egypt to abandon their Sudanese empire. And it was to assist with this evacuation that darling of the British public, General Charles Gordon, was sent to Khartoum. However, rather than evacuate the city completely, he decided to defend it and was besieged by the Mahdi's forces. Meanwhile, to support the Egyptian evacuation of their besieged garrisons on the Red Sea coast, the British sent a field force under General Gerald Graham VC to the port of Suakin. He fought two successful engagements against the Mahdist general Osman Digna and his Beja tribesmen at El Teb and Tamai. But having failed to rescue the Egyptian garrisons, the British force was evacuated in April 1884, about the same time as Gordon now found himself besieged in Khartoum. With their hero Gordon in danger, the British public demanded that Prime Minister Gladstone organise a military operation to rescue him, which, through gritted teeth, he agreed to do. An army under Britain's military hero of the hour, General Sir Garnet Wolsey, was sent to the Sudan. Wolsey's Nile expedition resulted in two more British victories at Abu Klea and Abu Kru, but was too late to relieve Gordon. He was killed when Mahdist forces stormed Khartoum in January 1885. Britain was shocked, both at the death of their hero and their inability to prevent it happening. The British government now felt obliged to do something to show the British public and the world in general that Gordon's death would not go unpunished. The problem was actually what to do. But before I tell you what they decided, if you're enjoying this, then please hit the like button below. Wolsey was ordered to march on Khartoum, despite there being no Gordon to rescue, and defeat the Sudanese army of the Mahdi. However, with the desert summer imminent, Wolsey, who previously accused Gladstone's government of dragging their feet, now applied the brakes himself and argued that any advance should be delayed until the autumn. An eight-month delay was hardly the robust response being demanded by the British public, the newspapers and Gladstone's Conservative opponents in Parliament, a clamour led by the upcoming star of the Conservative Party, Lord Randolph Churchill. There needed to be a short-term plan B, and they found one. Are you ready for it? Here it is. General Graham would once more be sent to Suakin on the Red Sea coast. This second Suakin expedition had two objectives. The first would be to bring the Dervish general Osman Digna to heel. 
Despite his defeats at El Teb and Tamai the year before, Digna had managed to reassert his control of the region. His defeat would prove to the British public that the war was being taken to the Sudanese. The second purpose of the expedition was an ambitious plan to construct a 280-mile railway across the inhospitable desert, linking Wolsey's Nile expedition to the Red Sea coast, a much shorter supply line than his current one all the way up the Nile from Egypt. A contract to build the railway was hurriedly awarded to the engineering partnership of Lucas and Aird. Now, whilst Lucas and Aird as a brand name has long faded from memory, at the time, they were one of the trailblazers in Victorian construction and engineering. During the quarter century of their partnership, they were responsible for the construction of the Royal Albert Dock in London and, more pertinent to this expedition, the West Highland Railway. Their engineers travelled to Egypt to join Graham's military expedition, heading down the Red Sea towards Sudan. On the 12th of March 1885, Graham's 13,000-strong field force began to land at Suakin. This second Suakin expedition, also called the Suakin Field Force, comprised of units from the regular British Army, along with the Royal Marine Light Infantry and the Royal Naval Brigade, together with units from the Indian Army. A week later, scouts reported that Osman Digna's army was gathering near the hills at Hashin, about five miles inland from the coast. General Graham took the bulk of his force, 8,500 men, out to meet them. In what became known as the Battle of Hashin, some people spell it Hashin, fought on the 20th of March, men of the 1st Royal Berkshire Regiment, along with the Royal Marine Light Infantry, captured the dominating Dilibat Hill. As men from the Coldstream, Grenadier and Scots Guards, together with units from the Indian Army, advanced in support, they suddenly came under attack from more dervish troops concealed in the scrub. Nevertheless, in a very one-sided affair, the dervish were forced to evacuate their positions and were then driven from the battlefield by cavalry charges from the 5th Royal Irish Lancers, the 20th Hussars and the 19th Bengal Cavalry. British losses amounted to two officers and a handful of men. And whilst the Mardis losses were larger, it could be argued that the Battle of Hashin was more of a skirmish than an actual battle. It was certainly not the decisive defeat of Osman Digna that Graham was looking for. And it was Graham's desire to gain this victory that was to result in the most bloody battle in this expedition. Keep with me to find out about the Battle of Tofrek. Just two days later, General Graham decided to tighten the screws on Osman Digna by constructing two zareba about six and eight miles inland from the coast. If you're wondering what a zareba is, I'm going to explain that in a while. But fundamentally, they were makeshift fortifications. There were, however, some notable differences between this and the Hashin operation. For a start, it would not be commanded by Graham. He delegated command to Major General Sir John Carstairs McNeil, VC. The 54-year-old McNeil had enjoyed a stellar military career. Born in Argyllshire, Scotland, when he was just 19, he had joined the Indian Army in Bengal as an officer and served in both the siege and capture of Lucknow during the Indian Sepoy Mutiny. In the 1860s, he had seen further action in the Maori Wars in New Zealand, when he had been awarded the Victoria Cross for going to the aid of an unhorsed soldier. He then served under General Wolsey in the Red River Expedition in Canada and again in the Ashanti War in West Africa during the 1870s. Another difference between the two operations was that Neil's column had only limited cavalry support, just one squadron of the 5th Royal Irish Lancers and a squadron of mounted infantry, and absolutely no artillery presence. Are you getting an idea of where this may be heading? Before I tell you how this story pans out, if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss future videos. On the night of the 21st of March, General McNeil's force moved off. Apart from the cavalry units already mentioned, it consisted of two companies of engineers and five battalions of infantry, about 3,000 men in total, considerably smaller than Graham's force at Hashin. The two companies of engineers who would oversee the construction of the Zariba forts were from the Royal Engineers and the Madras Sappers of the Indian Army. This latter unit had a long history, having been formed back in the 1780s. The five battalions of infantry who would provide both manpower to build the forts as well as firepower 
were drawn from both the British and Indian armies. First up, fresh from the Battle of Hashin, you had the Royal Marine Light Infantry and the 1st Battalion of the Royal Berkshires. The three remaining infantry battalions came from the Indian contingent, the 17th Bengal Native Infantry, the 28th Bombay Pioneers, and the 15th Ludhiana Sikh Regiment. Finally, McNeil would be accompanied by four Gardiner machine guns manned by the Royal Naval Brigade. Now, before you get all excited or maybe upset that the British had machine guns, it's worth remembering that they hadn't performed with much success so far in the Sudan campaign, not least at the Battle of Abu Klea two months earlier. Along with the armed men were 1,500 transport animals carrying materials to build the Zariba, as well as food, ammunition, and most importantly, water. These animals would present their own problems, as you're going to find out in a moment. But before that, for reasons never properly explained, General Graham decided to change the route of the advance. Rather than following the track from Suikin towards Tamai, he ordered McNeil to move southwest through unmapped and unscouted countryside. The net result was that McNeil's men found themselves trying to advance through a forest of mimosa trees and bushes, with razor-sharp thorns ripping through uniforms and impaling the transport animals. Eventually, the column reached an open area about six miles from Suakin, and McNeil decided that this would be as good a place as any for the first Zariba. Zariba are temporary fortifications made out of materials to hand in this part of the world. Sometimes boulders would be used, but more often the thorny mimosa bushes provided the defensive structure. The trees would be cut down and the trunks lashed together, making them hard for an enemy to pull aside. Of course, the sharp thorns helped make a vicious barrier, akin to sort of barbed wire, as the British and Indian troops had found out that very morning. The planned fortification would consist of two redoubts, uh, one at the north end, one at the south, separated by a central square. The working parties of Royal Engineers, Madras Sappers and some of the Berkshires started to cut down the thorn trees. Other members of the Berkshires worked on the southern redoubt, whilst the Royal Marines cracked on with its counterpart to the north. And all the while, the three Indian infantry units stood guard in case the dervish attacked. By 2pm, the Royal Marines had completed their part of the fortification, and the Berkshires were close to completing their redoubt when at 2.45pm, members of the Royal Irish Lancers galloped in to report that a large force of dervish were gathering to the south and west. The very thorn trees that had provided such good raw materials for the construction of the Zariba had a downside. They also provided cover for the dervish warriors to advance almost unscathed to the British positions, which was useful because unlike at Tamai and El Teb, it was the Sudanese who were outnumbered, 2,000 versus 3,000 British. More lancers came zigzagging through the trees towards the partially completed camp, and right behind them were the fleet-footed dervish warriors. Suddenly, several things happened almost at once. First, the 17th Bengal Infantry had the unnerving experience of being charged by their own galloping lancers, and then by 2,000 fearsome dervish warriors right behind them. They let off a couple of volleys and then retreated into the unfinished, or hardly started, central area of the Zariba, between the two redoubts. Secondly, the 1,500 transport animals stampeded. The chaos of careering animals was combined with the dust they'd stamped up and the notorious smoke of the Martini Henry rifles being fired by the defenders. Animals, along with the British and Indian soldiers, were swept through the camp by the wave of Sudanese attackers. The Royal Marines in their redoubt held firm, but everywhere else the defenders formed small squares to try and stem the tide. The dervish warriors managed to break into the incomplete redoubt being manned by the Berkshires. In heavy hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they were finally driven out. Afterwards, the British counted 112 dead Sudanese warriors inside the redoubt. Such was the ferocity and fearlessness of the Sudanese attack. As the animals finally passed through the camp and out to the other side, the confusion and dust subsided, and the professionalism and firepower of the British and Indian soldiers started to tell. Facing withering volley fire, and without the numbers to overwhelm the defenders, the Sudanese fell back. Almost as suddenly as it had started, the battle was over. The Battle of Tofrek, sometimes called the Battle of McNeil's Zariba, had lasted 25 minutes. 
But in those 25 minutes of chaos, the British had lost 70 men killed and over 100 injured. Afterwards, nearly 1,000 dervish bodies were counted in and around the Zariba. It was a British victory, but it had been too close for comfort. Once more, the bravery of the Sudanese, and in particular, Osman Digna's Beja tribe, had earned the respect of the British. Nevertheless, a victory is a victory. So is that the end of the story? Well, not quite. This is where things get even more interesting. My Australian viewers will get a sense of pride, and everyone else will probably say, I never knew that. Are you ready? One week after the Battle of Tofrek on the 29th of March, 1885, a contingent of over 750 men from Australia landed at Suakin. Following the death of General Gordon, the British accepted an offer of military support from the government of New South Wales. On the 3rd of March, a battalion of infantry, an artillery battery and a field ambulance detachment marched through cheering crowds in Sydney before embarking for Sudan. It was the first time that Australian troops had served abroad. Unfortunately for the enthusiastic Australians, after the Battle of Tofrek and with Wolsey not yet advancing on Khartoum, the war had died down and they found themselves mainly guarding the construction of the railway line. No doubt they would have gone into action again in the autumn, but for events far away in Afghanistan. By one of those coincidences in history, the day after the Australians landed in Sudan, an incident between Afghan and Tsarist Russian forces raised the spectre of a Russian invasion of Afghanistan, and with it, a threat to British interests in India. Britain went on war alert, and suddenly the British government and the public lost interest in avenging Charles Gordon, as attention turned to saving India from the Russian bear. Within three weeks, on the 20th of April, the Secretary of State for War, Lord Hartingdon, announced the withdrawal of all British forces in Sudan, and at the end of the month, Graham was ordered to abandon building the railway. Just 20 of the 280 mile track from Suakin to Berber had been completed, at a cost of nearly £1 million. Much of the rolling stock was sold to the Egyptians, whilst five locomotives destined for Sudan ended up instead on the railway lines at Woolwich Arsenal. On the 17th of May 1885, just over two months after landing, General Graham and most of his Suakin field force, including the Australians and the engineers from Lucas and Aird, were once more evacuated from the coast. The Suakin expedition, just like its predecessor the year before, had achieved no strategic results. Osman Digna was still in the field and was to spring up again immediately after the British evacuation. The Nile expedition was wound up and General Sir Garnet Wolsey returned to Britain, never to lead an army in the field again. For that matter, neither would General Graham or General McNeil command in the field again either. McNeil retired from the army in 1890 and he died in 1904 and is buried in his native Argyllshire. General Gerald Graham VC died in 1899 and is buried in Biddeford, Devon. Of the units involved on the British side at the Battle of Tofrek, the Royal Engineers and the Royal Marines are still in existence. The 5th Royal Irish Lancers, through various amalgamations, now form part of the Royal Lancers. And likewise, the Royal Berkshires are part of the 1st Battalion, the Rifles. Of the Indian units, the 17th Bengal Infantry and the Bombay Pioneers were disbanded between the World Wars. But the Lutiana Sikh Regiment, which fought on the Western Front in the First World War, is now part of the Sikh Regiment in the modern Indian Army. And likewise, the Madras Sappers are now the Madras Engineer Group. And what of those Aussies? Well, forget World War I or World War II or even the Boer War. The first Australian battle honour is actually Suakin, Sudan, 1885. And whilst none of the soldiers from New South Wales were killed in action, although three were wounded, Robert Weir died from disease and therefore became the first Australian to die abroad on active service. The Sudanese, under the Mahdi's successor, the Khalifa, would remain independent for the next decade, whilst around them, the European powers participated in the scramble for Africa. Some token British forces did stay in Sudan. Suakin remained an enclave of Anglo-Egyptian control, and a few garrisons remained in the very north, preventing any Sudanese advances into Egypt. 
and it was in the north, right at the end of 1885, that the British were to fight their final engagement in this part one of their Sudanese wars. It would also be the last battle that the British were to fight in their famous redcoats. And that battle, the Battle of Guinness, will be the subject of my next story. Well, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this story. Check out some of my other videos and watch out for my next one all about the British Redcoats going into action for the last time at the Battle of Guinness. Until then, thanks for your support, keep well and I'll see you very soon.